Ready? something about human beings and standing stones. I brought my grandkids here about a month ago. We made a pile of stones that must have been about four and a half feet tall. Come on, Penny. But standing or bound stones is a very ancient tradition. We were walking out to an ancient Iron Age fort on one of the Scottish islands. And as we walked alongside a farmer's field, my son, who was about 10 there, pointed out this big pile of rocks in the middle of his field, that that must be some sort of ancient ruin. In an act of intellectual support of my son, I replied, nah, it's just what the farmer did with the stones in his field. When we get out to the Iron Age Fort, I pulled out the guidebook to read to my kids what this was all about. And it began with, as you walked past the farmer's field, you probably noticed a ruin in the middle of the field. This is one of the earliest archaeological sites in all of the United Kingdom, and it dates back to at least 10,000 BC. Now, I might like to pile up stones every now and then, but some people are really good at it. And I'm going to include a link under this video to someone who has incredible talent in this area, making impossible looking balanced rock. All of this brings me to the subject of today's video. Jacob, his dream, and his standing stone in Genesis 27 and 28. Now this story is too long for me to read. And what I would suggest is get out your Bible and follow along in your own text as I go through the explanation of it. Once again, we have the story of two brothers. This theme started off in Genesis chapter four with Cain and Abel. Then we saw it picked up in the story of Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac. And now it continues here in the story of Jacob and Esau. Man, I even waited until about six o'clock. We're in the middle of this heat wave right now. And it's still 90 degrees out at six o'clock. And this story reminds us a lot of the story of Cain and Abel in several different ways. Abel, his name meant emptiness or vapor, and Cain was the made man. In this story, Esau is the mighty hunter, but we're told that Jacob spends his time in the tents with the women. So immediately we get these sort of parallels in character and nature between the two brothers that go all the way back to Genesis chapter four. But unlike Genesis chapter four, in this story, it's the vulnerable or the weaker one who is going to outdo or do violence to his brother. We have two brothers who have been at conflict since birth. We're told that when they're born, that Jacob was holding on to the heel of his brother who was born first, Esau. And earlier, Jacob took advantage of Esau's hunger when he came back from hunting and he had prepared a stew and Jacob was famished and he begged Esau for some of the stew. And being the conniving little guy that he is, Jacob required that Esau give him his blessing before he would feed him any soup. I don't know about you, but any brother who tries to steal his brother's inheritance when he's hungry and is in need 
really isn't much of a brother at all. Now in this story, it's Isaac's wife, Rebecca, who is the prime instigator in the story. She overheard Isaac asking Esau to go out and catch some game so that he could prepare Isaac's favorite meal and then Isaac would give him his blessing. And she hatches a plan to steal Esau's blessing. Rebecca hastily concocts a plan with the help of Jacob. And Jacob realizes that this plan may not go right. He realizes that his brother is a very hairy man and he's not. And so he's worried that he'll be discovered. Will Isaac recognize that he's not Esau? And then as Jacob serves his father the meal, the two of them are very, very close and intimate. And all throughout the meal, the author writes in a way that highlights this tension. Will Jacob be discovered? Or will they get away with their plan? Isaac's an old man now. He's lost his sense of sight. And it sounds like, as you read this story, that he's suffering from a little bit of dementia as well. And in the story, the two of them are so close that Isaac is able to reach out and feel Jacob's hands and the back of his neck and smell him. They're within inches of each other and it really raises a lot of tension. Will he be discovered or not? And Jacob's deception is made all the more dramatic by this proximity and how the story is told. This story is also rather comical as well that Esau is as hairy as an animal. And Isaac and Rebecca don't think that tying animal skins around his hands and his neck won't be discovered by Isaac. In the drama here also, we have the question whether Esau will arrive back from the hunt before Isaac has eaten his special stew and given his blessing to Jacob. There's this kind of time clock ticking in the background to the story and we wait to discover whether Rebecca and Jacob will get away with their plan to steal Esau's blessing. And then Jacob's lines convey the depths of his deception. When he says, I am Esau, your firstborn. And then he continues on, because the Lord brought it to me, explaining why he was able to return so quickly with an animal. The first is an outright lie. The second verges on blasphemy, but they get away with their plan just in the nick of time because Esau returns with his meal for Isaac. When Isaac and Esau learn of the deception, once again, the author engages in theatrics. The two are morally outraged and crying about what has taken place. It also raises questions about how God's blessings could be gained by such a deceptive means. Rebecca and Jacob's actions are totally indefensible and utterly repugnant. However, in Genesis, the characters are not portrayed in such a black and white fashion. Abraham and Sarah committed numerously morally outrageous practices, and this is one of the traits of biblical stories. Our characters are always morally ambiguous. Even though Jacob has stolen Esau's blessing, when Esau marries the two Hittite wives, they make life miserable for Isaac and Rebekah. And as a result, Jacob's fortunes within the family begin to change. Just like Abraham sent one of his servants back to Haran to where his family settled on their migration from Ur to the Promised Land, he now sends Jacob back there to find a wife for himself. Or does Esau's marriage to the Canaanites reflect on Isaac's neglect of duty. Remember, Abraham sent his servant back to Haran to get a wife for Isaac. Why hasn't Isaac done the same for Jacob and Esau? Within this story though, we're deliberately told that Isaac only called for Jacob to receive his blessing. He tells him, make some of that delicious stew that I love 
and then I will give you my blessing. One can't be reminded of Esau, who some years earlier swapped his birthright for stew as well. Isaac and Esau are both alike in putting their appetites first. In this way, the author wants to see that the blame for what follows lies not simply with Isaac and Esau or Jacob, but it's really in the relationship between all of them. Jacob's scheme results in his not only stealing Esau's blessing, ooh, but it also serves as the reason why he must leave his family. Esau is angry and he wants to kill Jacob as a means to regain his birthright and his blessing. And remember, he's the mighty hunter and Jacob is not. Again, Rebecca thwarts the plans and intervenes by having Isaac send Jacob back to their homeland to find a wife. In words very reminiscent of his father's instructions, Isaac says to Jacob, do not marry one of the Canaanite girls. Okay, we start over. In words very reminiscent of his father, in Genesis chapter 24, Abraham told his servant to go to my country and find a wife for my son Isaac. And with Jacob's farewell blessing, we have a reiteration of the Abrahamic blessing, but this time it rests on Jacob and not Esau. I don't know how these guys do it. They're pretty good. In chapter 28, verse five, we have the first time in the story where Esau does not obey his father. He takes other wives from the people there because he saw that this really frustrated his mother and father. This displeased them. And then by taking one of Ishmael's daughters to be his wife, we really have the cementing of two stories in Genesis together, Ishmael and Esau's. Their marriage reinforces the idea that neither of these older sons received the blessing, rather it went to the younger son. While I wrestle with these rocks, I'm gonna pull up a map on the screen here that shows Jacob's flight to Haran, to his uncle's house. Now Jacob probably took the central ridge road that ran through the hill country of Beersheba, through Hebron, Bethel, Shechem, and to join the ancient highway, which was known as the Great Trunk Road. It would have taken a couple days to get from Beersheba to Bethel, about 60 miles. And then from there, the trip to Haran would have taken over a month. He would have walked for over 500 miles. Remember that Abraham received promise of God's blessing in chapter 15 in a vision. Jacob is going to see the Lord in a dream also. And in both narratives, there is a divine confirmation in regard to establishing this covenant of the promise and the blessing that is going to come through Abraham to other families. The gift of the land, the promise of great prosperity, and the blessing to all nations. Now, one of the things to realize is that in the ancient Near East, dreams were an important means of divine revelation and communication throughout the ancient Near East and within Israel as well. Many of the prophets were known for receiving oracles through dreams and visions. Jacob is gonna have one here at Bethel. Joseph is gonna be an interpreter of dreams and have dreams as well. And then we come all the way down to Daniel, for example, who was known for his ability to interpret dreams. And this stairway or ladder that's mentioned within this passage here were common throughout the ancient Near East as well. In Akkadian and Mesopotamian mythology, these ladders were used to describe how the messenger of God traversed between the two different realms, between the heavenly and the earthly spheres. And it's this mythical ladder or stairway between these two realms that the Babylonians sought to represent in the architecture of their ziggurats and probably stands behind the story of the Tower of Babel as well. If God can send his messengers to earth down these stairways, 
then we can build a tower that allows them to come to our city. The top of this stairway would have been used by the messengers or the priests, but the bottom of the stairway or the ziggurat or tower was where the temple for that particular deity was. This way, the Patreon deity could leave the assemblies of the god and descend to the place of worship. The mentioning of this stairway or ladder in this story also alerts us to the fact that the characters in our story are part of the ancient Near Eastern culture. They sort of believe and think the same way the other people within those cultures did as well. Israel is not that different from its surrounding nations yet. And Jacob's background would have given him familiarity with this concept. Thus, he would conclude that this was a sacred spot that he was at, a passageway or a connection between the two worlds. Though he sees this stairway or ladder in his dreams, and the messengers or the angels are processing between the two realms, oh, that's not very good, and they're returning back to the heavenly realm. And the other thing to note is that God is not depicted as ascending or descending this ladder. He stands beside it. The Lord's words in verse 15, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land, becomes the guiding principle that's going to govern Jacob's journey in the rest of the book of Genesis. The purpose of Jacob's dream in this chapter is to show that in all the events of the narratives that have happened so far and are about to happen are part of God's plan. When Jacob wakes up in the morning, he identifies his sacred place as the house of God, Bethel. Now, sacred pillars or standing stones were known throughout the ancient Near East. Going back as far as 4000 BC, we have archeological record of this. Jacob erected his pillar at this place. He takes the stone that he had used for sleeping on the night and then stood it up as a memorial to remember this place. Jacob's dream and his erecting the standing stones serve to reinforce and commemorate that God's blessings have now passed to the younger son. And once again, the son that should have received the blessing, Esau, was bypassed. The way that God works is not the way that we think he does. And this should serve as a powerful reminder to us today. We think that if we do A, B, and C, then God will do X. If only it were that simple. Well, it looks like my work here is done. That is about as good as I can do. Be sure to take a look at that video of the guy who's good at piling stones. This is not very good compared to what he did, but till next week, peace.